prices, ozone emission rates, and test methodology. Uh, our speaker today is Glenn Morrison uh, from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. And I'm Jeff Williams. I'm the contract manager on this project. Now, what I'd like to do is provide everybody with just a very quick background uh, on this study. First, talk about why ARB funded the study. Uh, now, in 2007, uh, ARB adopted a regulation that limited ozone emissions from portable indoor air cleaning devices. However, di devices that were physically integrated into the central air system, these induct devices, were exempted uh, because we had no ozone emissions test method for them, and also there was no real-world ozone emissions data from such devices. Uh, nevertheless, we were concerned that some induct devices may generate significant amounts of ozone. Uh, so we wanted to gather more information to assess whether we would need to include these devices in our regulation. <clears throat> we had several objectives for this study. One was to develop, to develop a test method for measuring ozone emissions of induct air cleaners. Another is to use the laboratory test method to measure ozone emission rates from commercially available induct models. Also to conduct field testing to measure emissions and ozone concentrations from induct devices installed in California buildings. And then finally to estimate impact on indoor ozone concentrations and health risk in California buildings. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Glenn Morrison. Dr. Morrison is a professor of environmental engineering at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He's an NSF career awardee, fellow of the Academy of the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, known as ISIAC, and the current vice president of ISIAC. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Dr. Williams. <clears throat> so um, I'll use the pointer on here to point out things. Hopefully, you'll be able to see the pointer on the slide for those of you that are um, online. Uh, before I start, I'd like to point out that this project was um, a collaboration um, with the University of Tulsa and the University of Texas. Um, Richard Shaughnessy was the pr principal investigator at the University of Tulsa and was responsible for most of the field work, and Jeff Siegel was the PI at the University of Texas at Austin, and he was responsible for most of the laboratory-based research. Um, this is a bit of an overview. It's, um, and I'll, as uh, Dr. Williams said, the California regulates ozone emitting air cleaners, but excludes the types of devices that are, um, can go into duct work um, because um, we just didn't have enough data on how they worked and, and how to regulate them. Um, and the central objectives were basically to develop a test method and test it on devices and determine um, what the impact of those devices would be in field homes. Um, a, few, a little bit of background, ozone, um, as most of you know, is not good for you. <laughs> um, it basically has almost no threshold uh, from an epidemiological point of view, and it causes a, a wide variety of respiratory problems um, and even short-term increased mortality. The air cleaner regulation that was promulgated in 2007 by the Air Resources Board essentially is designed for standalone devices, uh, devices that can, um, can, are air cleaners that stand alone and can be put into a test chamber. The test chamber, when the device is operating, the concentration in the test chamber should um, get to no greater than 50 parts per billion. And in fact, the part of the test method is to measure at the face of the device if there's an obvious face of the device. Um, and this gives you an idea why you might not be able to use a method like this for devices that are in ducts where the conditions are quite different, where the flow rates across the device are much higher than you would have in a test chamber. Devices like that, standalone air cleaners, emit ozone at a wide variety of emission rates. As you can see here, um, it goes from anywhere from less than 0.1 milligrams per hour to greater than 100 milligrams per hour. It's a very wide dynamic range. And those emission rates at the high end can certainly increase ozone concentrations, or at least predicted to increase ozone concentrations indoors um, to greater than 50 parts per billion. To put this in context, the ozone injection rate um, that you would find in a typical house during a typical smoggy day, for example, in California, is that broad arrow. It can be relatively low to relatively high. And this comes from infiltration of ozone from outdoors through just leaks uh, in the building shell. 
And so devices that are emitting at that rate are essentially the same as what you would get from, um, from infiltration of smog. In ducts, um, there are a wide variety of devices that might emit ozone. The most common historically has been the plate and wire electrostatic precipitator with uh, an image of one shown to the right there. There are also devices that are explicitly known as ozone generators, or they, they are self-reported as ozone generators, and others that have a wide, uh, names like ion generator or hydroxyl generator. Those, uh, and a lot of these devices are not plate and wire, but are actually uh, UV lights. And we'll see some images of these in a minute. There are very few measurements of devices in ducts that um, emit ozone, like this air cleaners that emit ozone. Um, and uh, we needed definitely more uh, data in the field for these kind of devices. So as uh, Dr. Williams said, the specific objectives are shown here. Um, test method, test devices. Go to the field, see how these work in the field, and then um, kind of wrap this up by estimating what what kind of impact these would have on California homes. We separated the project into um, these tasks. I'm going to speak mostly to task one through five, um, and I'll discuss each of them as we go along. In this first section is the methods section, I'll just sort of a setup for how we did, uh, performed each of the tasks. The first task was to develop a candidate device essentially divide, uh, develop a list of devices that we could test um, in the laboratory or in the field. And the way we did this was to contact, the mo contact installers in California to find out what kind of devices they're installing, what are the most uh, popular devices. Um, and we also talked to the manufacturers and distributors to find out what kind of devices are being sold in California. Um, the, we, we discussed um, the possibility of doing this testing with various uh, federal and state agencies um, to find out what their opinions were, which devices were they most interested in. And th from this, we developed a list. In task two, um, the goal was to do two things, develop a test method along with an example test rig um, and actually test devices um, in a laboratory setting. So this test method was to be laboratory based, not a field test method. It was to be a ducted system that operated with conditions that were realistic of what you would see in um, ducted, uh, uh, mainly residential, but it could apply to small commercial systems as well, with a range of flow rates. The central sort of um, idea of this me method was to be able to calculate, or at least measure, I should say, I should say measure an emission rate. And that emission rate would be based on the concentration increase across the device. So imagine air flowing by the device, there's an ozone increase because ozone is being generated by the device on one side versus the other, and you take that difference and you multiply it by the volumetric flow rate, and that will give you an emission rate under those conditions. The apparatus that was actually constructed um, was closed loop. It had a, a flow rate up to 3,000 cubic meters per hour, and had um, you could vary conditions in this system. It had filtration, and it could accommodate a wide variety of air cleaners. These, these devices, these air cleaners, are very, very different configurations, as you'll see. Um, this is a schematic of that test device. The air flows in this direction across through the, through the duct. Um, a device will be installed at this point. Sampling for ozone would occur upstream and downstream with a sufficient distance downstream to allow for good mixing. And this was uh, vetted during the uh, development of the method. There was air filtration and a couple of air handling units to allow for a wide range of velocities. This is an image of the uh, system from the back. It's easier to take a picture from the back of the system. It's about 30 feet long and about six feet high. The, um, you can see those two air handlers and the air is flowing, in this case, because we're looking at the back of it, it's actually flowing in this direction, like this, through an air cleaning section, a section of, of HEPA filtration activated carbon. And this is where the device would actually be installed. It actually gets installed on the other side of this image. <coughs> and it's a fairly big section to allow for a wide variety of configured devices. These are descriptions of the devices. Um, these. The, we use, to some degree, the manufacturer's own descriptions of the devices. Um, some, for example, photohydroionization, um, ozone generator was actually part of the manufacturer's um, uh, description and some of these, for some of these devices. 
Um, the electrostatic precipitator here was clearly a plate and wire type of electrostatic precipitator. And so you can see, we'll, we'll um, show this list again. There were eight different devices tested in the lab, but there were a total of 12 uh, actual units tested. And you can see some were tested, three different tests, for example, uh, number two, we had three different devices that we could test or I should say units of the same device. These are images of those devices that are from the manufacturer's websites, actually. Um, and you can see this one here is a actual electrostatic precipitator. And most of these others, although they have different descriptions of how they work, they do, almost all of them incorporate somewhere in them a ultraviolet light. So that was task two, the laboratory work. Task three was, um, the, the purpose of task three was actually to develop a field method um, because we didn't have one for this kind of work exactly. What we needed was a way to test these devices as they're supposed to be operating in a house and um, get some useful information out of those tests. Um, and so the, the, test were, the test of method development was, took place in Tulsa. The reason for that was because Richard Shaughnessy is at the University of Tulsa, and, and it was more straightforward to develop the test in a actual house in Tulsa and then export that method to California. The Tulsa field site was um, chosen to be representative of a typical Calif small California house. Um, and they reviewed 10 houses and chose one to, as, as appropriate for that. Um, and we'll see results from that house as well as the California houses. The test method, the purpose of the test method was to measure the incremental increase in ozone concentration that results from operation of the device and to also measure what we call the effective emission rate from the device. Um, this is sh in sort of like stepping back, theoretically it's the same value you would get in the lab, but it's not quite the same value because you have a, a completely different, um, well, I shouldn't say completely different, the lab test is supposed to measure the emission rate and it does, but when you're in the field you can't control everything. And so this is to back calculate and determine whether the lab emission rate and the field emission rate that we calculate from this are reasonably consistent. Um, we would prep the building. This is the, the test method requires that you prep the building in such a way as to um, reduce the um, air exchange rate to a reasonable value. So there's no large leaks. For example, if there's a fireplace shell, you want to seal that up. So there's not a lot of air moving through the building. And the fans are off. Um, you install the device. And we installed the device. You actually had a, um, uh, a professional um, installer install the device and also to inspect the duct system to make sure everything was working properly before any kind of um, work was done. And then we would set up sampling in these locations, outdoors, center of a room, a supply, and a return duct location. The specific measurements were to measure the concentration of ozone with the device on and off and with a long enough period of time to, re to get reasonably um, uh, constant concentrations at each level, um, things change. You can't control that very much in the field. And so you have to expect, you have to um, get enough data to feel like you're, you're measuring the true difference. Um, and it's usually pretty obvious when you have a high emitter. The, um, we also measured indoor and outdoor concentrations and measured the air exchange rate and ozone decay rate by injecting CO2 and ozone into the house and watching these two decay. The decays tell you two things. One, the air exchange rate, how much air is moving through the house, but also tells you um, how reactive the house is. And you can use this information to calculate an effective ozone emission rate. And you can see the calculation here. The, we have two different ways of doing this because of the data that we had. You can determine or estimate the effective uh, emission rate from the difference between the indoor and outdoor concentration when the device is operating, or from the um, value that you get when the device is off and the value you get when the device is on indoors. It's two different ways, and they should be reasonably consistent. Task four, um, the purpose of task four was actually to go out and do these kind of field tests in California homes. But first, we had to actually select homes in California to do this kind of work. Um, we were hoping initially to get a lot of homes that had these devices pre-installed. That was, ended up being a lot more difficult than we thought. And we were able to get two, to two homes with devices already installed. And we got those from installer recommendations. The, um, 
All, we also got devices uh, from, or actually I should say we got homes from um, essentially sending out requests through listservs and talking to colleagues and emails to colleagues. Um, we vetted those homes, trying to, find, trying to find homes that would give us our, our the best results, results that we could um, e more easily understand. Basically, smaller homes um, uh, that are not very complicated, that were, you had easy access to ducts, to um, the air handler, et cetera. And also, of course, the, the homeowners were um, able to, allow, uh, to vacate the house for a day or two while we did these tests. In California, there were six homes that were tested. Um, shown here in the Davis and Sacramento uh, region. Um, and we also tested one, a device in one school. This is an image of one of those homes. This one happens to be, I think, in Garden Valley. And um, you can see the um, air handling system in the attic. The, uh, shown here, if you can see the pointer here, there are actually two devices installed in this, and we tested them separately. Um, and over here, this is an ozone analyzer that's hooked up to, I believe this was the uh, return in this house. And there's also, you can see a CO2 monitor sitting here. Task five was, the, the objective was to simulate indoor ozone concentrations based on our best understanding of building characteristics, building reactivity, air exchange rates in California homes. And from that information, sort of predict a range of concentrations that would probably result in those homes. We did this in two ways. We used a single zone model, which essentially assumes that the building is a well-mixed chamber, and it's a standard mass balance model um, that's been uh, used many, many times. We also used a multiple zone model to look to see if there was any uh, possibility of what we call hot spots, whether some rooms would be worse than others under certain conditions, or whether there would be temporal uh, time-dependent changes that might influence um, at certain times of the day or certain times when the air handler's on or off when things might spike, when ozone concentrations might spike. Um, this is the um, typical setup of one of these kinds of models. Essentially, this is a single zone model. And I won't go into the details of what all of these parameters mean, but the, the takeaway from this for you is that there are sources and sinks in a building. The sources are um, outdoor ozone coming in and the device emission rate. That's where all the ozone's coming from. The sinks are anything that can remove ozone by one mechanism or another, like air exchange. The, this right here has to do with surface and air chemistry, and this has to do with removal in the ductwork. These are inputs for the single zone model um, based on a literature search of, of values for homes, uh, typical home uh, values of volume size, uh, air exchange rates, that sort of thing. We defined a standard house and an at-risk house. A standard house was essentially middle of the road values for all of the parameters. And an at-risk house were, was parameters that were on the lower end, I should say, not the lower end, but on the end that would tend to um, amplify indoor ozone concentrations. So for example, a smaller house with lower reactivity and a lower air exchange rate. The multiple zone model was based on what's called CONTAM. This is a multiple, multiple zone model that actually that was uh, developed by NIST. Um, and it can include in, out, uh, environmental conditions like wind speed, uh, temperature, ambient ozone, and allowed us to vary things like air handling duty, uh, unit duty cycle. The duty cycle is just the on-off um, uh, cycle of the air handler that, as it's um, heating or cooling and service reactivity it includes all of these things, all the things that we needed to uh, answer the question, uh, are we going to see some interesting behavior in a, in a home uh, like this? Um, to the right is a uh, from NIST, it's a drawing that they did for a typical, Cal or sorry, I shouldn't say California home, but American home. What they do is they developed a, lo a long list of what they considered typical homes in the US and actually created these files for the CONTAM so software to allow anybody to, to just drop these houses into CONTAM and then use them any way they wanted. We did that. We chose this home because it um, seemed to us to be the typical of a small California home, and I can guarantee you it is because it looks exactly like the home I owned in Milpitas in 1994. And the, it's the exact same size, exact same layout, everything. Um, the, uh, 
that wasn't exactly why I chose it. It just happened to happen that way. <laughs> but the um, the we modified it slightly to include um, ozone, an ozone device um, in a separate zone that acted like the duct, and um, you can see the parameters here. We included ambient ozone in some of the simulations, and on the bottom is a table of the kind of simulations we did with different duty cycles and deposition velocities, which is, has, has to do with the reactivity of building surfaces and so forth. So that's the setup. That's how we set up the tasks. And I'll be giving you the main results to make sure we leave enough time for questions. So in task one, the idea was to develop a list of devices. We actually found that there are a lot of different devices that could produce ozone, and they are um, essentially self-reported to uh, produce other things, not necessarily ozone, like um, hydroxyl radicals and ions. But electrostatic precipitators are probably a big part of the market uh, and, and will continue to be. Um, there are something called electronically enhanced filters. There's UV light bulbs, just straight UV light bulbs used for disinfecting air. Um, photocatalytic oxidation is a growing market. So there's a lot of different devices and hybrid devices that combine these different methods. Again, this is that same list I showed you earlier of the um, different types of devices that were tested in the lab, I should say. These are lab devices. And uh, that's basically task one. We created a list and used that list um, for the rest of the project. The standard test method that we developed during task two um, ended up having um, a description of the major sections of, the, of a device to be used for testing. And you can see the details here. It specified how you would measure all of these parameters, temperature, flow rate, et cetera. They're in, it had detailed reporting, calculations, method qualification, all the kinds of things that you want in a test method. And the, with the goal of a emission rate, and what's, what's interesting about this one is that we specify that the emission rates are over a, a range of flow rates. This is a, the qualification test apparatus that was built. I showed it to you earlier. Um, the method qualification, or sorry, method quantification limit was 2.3 milligrams per hour for this device, um, which is actually pretty good for a device that big. Um, the repeatability is shown there. This is for a device um, that we tested um, quite a few times. Um, and this is something that I'll bring up a couple of times. Several of the devices that we tested did not always give you the same results every time. Some were extremely reliable, spot on, but some were not. And this is something that to keep in mind as you know, we go forward thinking about um, doing tests like this, that a single unit of a device and the way that device will operate from uh, day to day may not always be um, the, it may not always work the same way every single time. Um, and so you can see th this is a repeatability for a single device, mostly repeatable, but some variability um, primarily due to the device itself. This uh, image is probably the, one of the most important um, outcomes of the project. This is the emission rates from the eight devices that were tested in the laboratory. As you can see, several devices, one, four, and seven, uh, the emission rates were quite low, almost nothing. Uh, for several devices, they tended to be in this mid-range of between, say, 10 and 30 or so um, milligrams per hour emission rate. And then we had two devices that were um, above 50, at least for part of the testing, um, and one device over here, device eight, that was at 350 milligrams per hour. Okay, and so um, keep these numbers in mind as we talk further. What do these numbers really mean? We'll talk about their, um, what they mean in terms of the actual ozone concentrations that will result in the field. The emission rates for most of the devices was fairly independent of flow, and this is actually what we expected. The emission rate really should, uh, it, the, the way that uh, ozone is generated by many of these devices is, um, it should be relatively uh, insensitive to flow. Um, but it turns out that two of the devices had um, some uh, uh, flow dependence. Device five here, at least between 500 and 1,000, kind of consistently went down. The emission rate went down, but then it was flat after that. For device six, um, the emission rate tended to go up with, with flow fairly consistently. And this one actually had a flow switch in it, and there could be an internal mechanism that would adjust emission rates depending on flow. So this is something that we have to keep in mind as we develop uh, test methods for devices like this. The highest emitter, 
device eight was also fairly insensitive to flow rate. Some devices, uh, or at least one device, seem to have some sensitivity to other conditions. That's shown here. Not very sensitive to flow, but somewhat sensitive to temperature and relative humidity. Um, this is the emission rate. This is the flow rate here. And each of these lines represents a different set of environmental conditions. So for example, at high temperature and low relative humidity, you have um, a much lower emission rate from this device than you did under what we call standard middle of the road conditions, 25 degrees C, 50% relative humidity. So in summary, the laboratory work found that devices range from about nothing to about 350 milligrams per hour in terms of their emission rate. The highest emitters were UV lamps, at least in this study, or devices that, that used UV lamps. Two of the devices exhibited flow dependence, but in opposite directions, and one device exhibited some temperature and RH dependence. We did not test every device for relative humidity and temperature dependence. Tasks three and four, I am combining in the results. Uh, essentially, we are looking at um, the results from houses that were tested. And before I talk about the ozone results, I felt some of you would be interested in the building characteristics because um, we wanted to make it clear that these were typical houses. The air exchange rate shown here ranged from about 0.2 to 0.8 for all houses tested in uh, California and, Tul and in that the one in Tulsa. And that's uh, a typical of houses. Uh, typical average house air exchange rate is about 0.5, which is right in the middle of what we measured. Ozone decay rates have to do with the reactivity of the home. These also were consistent with what's in the literature for homes. Nothing particularly reactive, none, nothing particularly unreactive. Um, and there's a range of values um, which for different homes um, over time. Uh, this is uh, to some degree probably due to just changes in uh, conditions in the home. And something to keep in mind as we go forward that the reactivity of a home doesn't necessarily stay the same uh, from day to day, um, but doesn't vary a huge amount. The, um, this is the Second, probably most in useful slide or most important slide that comes from this research. These are the incremental increase in ozone concentration that resulted from using the devices in homes. It's grouped by device. As you see um, on the bottom here, this is the ozone increase when you, turn, when you have a background ozone concentration, low level in all homes all the time. You turn on the device, the ozone concentration increases and that difference is what we're showing here. The device two, three, nine, five, six, eight, I don't know why they're in this order, <laughs> but these are the different devices. And um, you can see that the, the um, well, let's take a look at these two first. These are the highest emitting ones. Um, you can see that both of these devices resulted in indoor concentrations that were above 50 parts per billion, at least in some cases, or at least in most cases. Um, they were both UV lamp devices. These are essentially average concentrations at different, uh, under different conditions. We actually saw for this device here, device eight, higher concentrations um, over shorter periods of time that were uh, up to 170. And we also saw it spike to over 200, but I'll show you that. Um, these devices down here um, had emission, or the emission rates resulted in ozone concentration increases on the order of 20 parts per billion or less. And this um, below about 20 parts per billion, I'd say below 10 certainly, that's really within the limit of our ability to measure in, in the field. These are the, um, the ozone emission rates as we determined from all the parameters that we measured in the field, um, the effective ozone emission rate in the field. And as you can see, it's kind of consistent with the ozone concentration increases we saw in the field, which makes sense. Um, device five and six, again, those are the two devices that tended to have, I would say, non-consistent behavior. Um, device five actually had a fairly high emission rate on its first uh, day out. And we were, it was very interesting. Wow, this is a, but after that, it never again emitted that high. And we actually, uh, I believe on that one, we tested two different models and could never get it to go that high again. Um, device six um, actually had a fairly high emission rate on its first field day out. <laughs> but then um, after that, it was lower. But it was also, um, device five in particular was quite unreliable. It sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. 
and device six seemed to be um, more variable in its output. Device eight was fairly reliable, although the, the changes in emission rate, the, this variability here, probably has more to do with the uncertainties that are inherent in trying to estimate an emission rate from field data. We did observe temperature dependence in the field, and this is, um, uh, I'll explain this in detail because I think it's uh, quite interesting and uh, tells us maybe where we should go in the future. This is device eight that was installed in a duct. And what we did was we had the device on and the fan on in this time frame, but the heating system was off. But as you can see, the indoor temperature, this is, um, this is uh, degree, uh, degree C or relative humidity, actually. And it was around 14 degrees C. That's getting pretty cold in the house. And so we decided to turn the heater on. Okay, we usually wouldn't have the heater on because we didn't want to influence our results. Uh, we wanted to be consistent in the way we were doing these experiments. But we turned the heater on and we just watched. And it was also midnight. It was after midnight. It was an interesting experiment. The, when you turn the heat on, the emission rate would go up very quickly. And the concentration in the home would go up quickly. And then, of course, the heater would go off. And this is roughly maybe a 20 or 30% duty, duty cycle for the heater. I can't really tell from the image here. Let me see. Actually, it's more than that. It's probably uh, maybe a 60% duty cycle for the heater. But regardless, you can see that um, the ozone concentration was going up and would have gone up a lot more if it, the heater had stayed on. Um, and you can see that in the living room, there was a spike of over 200 ppb in this case. On average, this was probably 160 during operation or so. So in summary, um, we developed a field method that we think we believe works quite well for testing um, the for the testing objectives that we had. There were two devices that had ozone incremental ozone concentration increases of greater than 50 parts per billion, um, and they were both UV lamps. Two devices that exhibited emission rates greater than 100 milligrams per hour at least part of the time. And uh, there was an evidence of a strong temperature effect. Task five, um, I'll only show you a few results from the slide just to give you a sense for um, how we would expect in general ozone concentrations to rise in homes in California. These are these single zone and multi-zone models. What you see here are the con concentration of ozone in a home and the source emission rate. This is that standard house, middle of the road building parameters uh, reactivity parameters, just middle of the road. What you see here is that um, we predict it would take about 150 to 175 milligrams per hour to increase the concentration of ozone in the house by 50 parts per billion. That's for a standard house. For the at-risk house that we defined, we find that you only need about 25 milligrams per hour to raise the indoor concentration to above 50 parts per billion. You see here, there's, I'm also showing this based on air exchange rate. Okay, so the lower the air exchange rate, the more risk, the, the higher the concentration will rise indoors, and that makes sense. Note here, our range of values that I have on the x-axis here goes from 0 to 350, which is exactly the range of values that we found in our research. So the higher emitter is going to be in an at-risk house, if you put that device in that house, you would, could have as high as 600 or 700 parts per billion in the house. The multi-zone model, I'll show you just a few slides from that. We, um, one of the characteristics of some of these devices is that you can install them without having them um, connected to the air handler. In other words, you can basically just plug it in and it'll be on all the time whether or not the air handler is operating or not. And um, so w we wanted to see if that made a difference. So first, if you have the air handler on just all the time with the device on, we didn't really see much difference in room characteristics. Like the, all the other rooms, it was basically a well-mixed chamber, which makes some sense because everything is mixing well because the air handler is on recirculating air throughout the house. But if you have the air handler off and this device still on, ozone builds up in the ductwork and wind-induced pressure gradients push that ozone through the ducts slowly into the rooms that are essentially downed gradient. And this, again, is a simulation. These are not measurements from the field, just simulations. And what you would expect to see from the simulations is that these rooms over here, I guess the bathroom and uh, bedroom two in this bathroom actually had um, somewhat higher concentrations of ozone, um, or much higher concentrations, I should say, than, uh, for example, the kitchen. And th this is the wind direction here. 
and these are the wind speeds that were put into the simulation. These are steady state results. If you have a different wind direction, you have a different result in different rooms that are impacted by the ozone moving through the ductwork, even with the air handler off. This is a dynamic result. I'm not going to show you, I'm only going to show you this one just to show you um, how, what, what kind of results we got. You'd have different concentrations in different rooms. These are diff the different colors represent different rooms. These are parts per billion, in ozone in parts per million, I should say. And this is time axis. Um, the interesting point part of this is basically spikes that would occur when the air handler was off and then on and off and then on. You see some rooms that would get some spikes in ozone in them. So in summary for task five, the modeling study, we found that a typical home would take about 150 milligrams per hour to rise above 50 parts per billion, but an at-risk home would have a much lower, um, would need a much lower emission rate to get there. And the, um, the multiple zone model showed that you can have differences in room concentrations for ozone. Combining the data that we got from the different tasks, we can do some comparisons between the laboratory and the field. Um, these are the emission rates as measured in the lab in the black bars and the emission rates as measured in the field in the blue bars. Broadly, you see consistency. Per, I'd say device six is the one that's less, the, the least consistent. Um, device 8, which tend to be a fairly reliable, consistent emitting of device, the field emission rates and the laboratory emission rates were very close. The ones on the low end here the, um, were broadly consistent. Um, uh, it turns out this starts getting to the limit of our ability to measure the ozone emission rate in field studies down in this range. And as I said before, device 6 was highly variable. Again, um, this is if you, so let me explain this slide. I think this is an important one. If you take the, the, the laboratory data for emission rates and insert it into the buildings that we tested for which we know their size, we know their air exchange rates, we know their reactivity, we can predict what the ozone concentration should be if you put that device in there. That's shown by the black bar. The blue bar is the actual measured concentration of ozone or at least the incremental increase. And broadly, it's consistent, with the exception of device six, which was a highly variable output device. And so that tells us that, it's, that the laboratory testing is probably a good way to go if we want to use a metric for uh, controlling, in, uh, contr uh, reducing the uh, impact of these devices in the field. We can use emission rate testing in the laboratory uh, as a good metric for deciding uh, which devices uh, to allow and which devices not to allow. So in overall summary, there was a, uh, a test method, laboratory test method, an apparatus that was built. We tested uh, 12 devices, 12 units, I should say, of eight different models um, and found a wide range of emission rates. The field tests, we found incremental increased concentrations up to 170 parts per billion. Um, that's actually a short-term value. But the, uh, the spike value was actually 200. And um, some of the devices had erratic emission rates. And the simulations, uh, you need about 25 to 150 milligrams per hour to rise, for a house to rise above 50 parts per billion, um, excluding outdoor ozone infiltration. I'd say one of the major conclusions from this is that we don't really need to do more field testing to demonstrate that these devices increase ozone concentrations in homes and that some devices can increase the ozone concentration is greater than 50 parts per billion. We might want to do more field testing if we want to understand how well these devices work over a long period of time, how they um, react to uh, field conditions over a long period of time, like relative humidity, temperature, as we know, temperature may be very important, and soiling. Um, I believe the laboratory method is adequate to predict the field impact. And um, I guess one of the major questions for the for us and for California will be to have a better understanding of, of occurrence. How many of these devices are out there and are they, um, uh, uh, how many do we expect to be in houses that could be impacted by them in a negative way? I'd like to acknowledge the California Air Resources Board for their support and especially Jeff Williams and Peggy Jenkins for all of their uh, help and all the folks here that have reviewed documents uh, for us, and Tom Phillips for the uh, work he did early on and getting this started. I'd like to thank the occupants and homeowners for all of their uh, generous time in allowing us into their homes. 
this long list of people are people in all three institutions that put a huge amount of work into this um, research. Uh, I'd like to call it Attila Novoselic, actually, for his work uh, recently in doing some uh, quick uh, last minute uh, tests for me. And uh, Debbie Bennett at UC Davis for helping out with some field work here in California. Jonathan Reyes at Sawyer Heating and some donations from uh, dealers and manufacturers. With that, I will uh, take questions. All right, so um, I guess I've got a couple of questions. Oh, do you want to do it? Oh, sure. Um, everybody hear me? Okay. So first, Glenn, thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. I really appreciate all your work, um, all your effort on this project. Um, we do have a couple of questions from folks online. Um, the first question was, could the speaker describe his ozone measurement instrument? Um, so that would be the first question. Oh, the ozone measurement instrument. Well, the, it's... Um, we used uh, se several instruments, but they all operate with the same principle of uh, ultraviolet light absorption. Um, one was a 2B. Uh, we used 2B devices and uh, one API device. Um, I'm not sure what more information yeah. they're interested in there. Yeah. And the, a follow-up, uh, again, this is, this is from Will Olison. Um, if a conventional FEM photometer, was it tested for interferences from indoor field home emissions from cooking, cleaning, other consumer product emissions? Uh, that's a good question. Some devices actually will um, be sensitive to things like that. Um, we, uh, the activities in the home were minimal because it was unoccupied. All the homes were unoccupied during these tests. And um, the, any background interference would, um, uh, because of the way we operated, were, were essentially um, uh, subtracted out, let's put it that way, because they were always, we were measuring before and after um, but the, we are very comfortable with the concentrations that we were measuring were actually true concentrations because there weren't any big sources of the kinds of things that could interfere like cooking. There's no cooking. We removed any, any things that we believe were, um, could be emitting uh, things uh, like candles um, and um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, 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 devices that, that produce um, like fragrances. Okay, we removed as much of that as possible. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? <laughs> of course. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. A very nice presentation. Um, for devices six and eight in particular, can you comment on, if you know this, how they're typically marketed, um, particularly in California, if you saw them marketed there otherwise? Are they primarily marketed through HVAC installers? Uh, are they sold on the internet directly to homeowners? Can you come in? Sure, sure. From what my understanding of these devices, uh, without talking about who they were and all that, um, they are marketed as ozone generators. Okay, so the, the purpose of them, they're, they are marketed to um, help uh, uh, reduce odors. And they have, um, they can be operated continuously or they can be operated um, at uh, sort of in a, a periodic mode to um, uh, supposedly remove um, odors uh, that build up. They have a, also um, have a, a dial on them that, uh, I think both of them had a dial on them to adjust the output of ozone. Only one of them, only one of them the dial actually do anything. So one of them it wasn't. From what I could tell, um, no installer or w ever admitted to installing one of these devices. We actually discussed this with uh, many of them and they said, no, we don't, we don't install those. Um, but they did anecdotally say we've seen them installed in home, homes before. Um, a homeowner, in any of these cases, a homeowner could install them, could just purchase them directly and install them. Although I do believe that, that there are um, HVAC uh, installers that do install these. I, I, that's, anecdotally, I know that does happen, but I couldn't say you know, what the proportion was. Yeah. Um, we have another question online. This is from Hal Levin. What accounts for the variations in emissions from UV lamps? What do these UV lamps emissions imply for their use in residential and in commercial buildings? Okay, uh, thanks for the question, Hal. Um, the variation, um, is, I, I, the, 
in, in detail, I'm not really sure why device six would be so variable. I believe that it was probably poor manufacturing and the electronics, you know, it could be just, um, who knows? Something in that, that particular device was uh, kind of just hinky, <laughs> again, say. Um, other variability, um, we do know that UV lamps are sensitive to temperature and they will change their output with temperature. And we, should, we, we would expect to see this in any of the devices that have a UV lamp to have some sensitivity to temperature. Um, and this is just, it's, it's physics. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, Hal had a follow up, another question, which is um, the graphics are almost unreadable in the broadcast on uh, either of the two devices I'm using. Is the presentation available for download? And yes, the presentation is available, and I apologize. Oh. Okay, Peter got to you on that question, so that's been covered. Um, okay. And Hal has one other question. Since the modeling simulations were done in the standard house, approximately 1,250 square feet, what is the impact of using the devices in significantly larger homes, such as the average new house size today? So something, say, around 2,500 square feet. Sure, sure. And if you, um, uh, the, all of this will be in the report, but a larger house has a ho larger volume, and for the same air exchange rate, you'll expect to see a much lower resulting ozone concentration. Yep. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, questions in the room? Hi, um, I was just wondering, did you have any thought, oh, Brandon Rose with the Air Resources Board, um, though it's not my day-to-day -day work, did you give any thought to any using building climate zones um, in terms of modeling this around the state and how that might affect? Sure, um, no, actually we explicitly, well I shouldn't say explicit, we, what we did was we, um, we did consider the, um, yes there's going to be differences basically in the difference between the indoor and outdoor temperature that will result from being in different climate zones and that influences air exchange rates um, and differences in uh, wind speed. Um, that seemed to be, what was more important, at least ultimately we believe was the actual air exchange rate and the sort of direction and pressure gradients that would result in the house. So we didn't try to, that seemed to, uh, that was a finer detail than we felt we needed to go to for this research. But if you have any suggestions, um, I'd like, sure, love to talk, talk to you about it. Okay, we have another question online. This is from David McIntosh. Was there a relationship between ozone decay rate and air exchange rate? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I'd have to look at the data. Um, the ozone decay rate um, that you uh, see is, uh, is actually, so th when you measure the ozone decay rate um, and you measure the air exchange rate, we do this simultaneously to find out the, um, essentially the removal rate of the building that's independent of the air exchange rate, you subtract the two. So subtract air exchange rate, uh, because part of the ozone decay rate is the air exchange rate. So if you subtract the two, theoretically they're independent. But that doesn't mean they are, and that's a really good point. If you have a higher air exchange rate, if you have something that induces more air movement in a building, you may actually have a higher ozone removal rate at surfaces um, just because of higher mixing. I didn't look at that. Um, I suspect that our data set may be, well, I don't know, it's, it's worth looking at it. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, this question comes from Douglas Grandy at DG Technologies. I'd like to know, are there any differences in UV light systems that, that explain the wide difference between units one and eight? Ah, sure. Well, some of the devices actually probably had um, lamps in them that, so for example, device eight probably had a UVC lamp that um, has a, a high emission rate at 185 nanometers that splits o oxygen into oxygen radicals, which generates ozone. The other devices probably had, um, that had UV lamps that had a different um, emission profile, um, or, I mean, not just a different emission profile, but also a different power output, or power usage, I should say. And so overall, what they're producing less um, light, UV light, at the wavelength that actually generates ozone. Um, and so you can get UV lamps that cover a wide, wide spectrum. The lamps that are above us right now, the are these fluorescents? Yeah, yeah, the fluorescent lamps above us operate by the exact same principle, but they have a phosphor in them that turns the UV light into light, into visible light, and the glass uh, prevents the UV uh, light from getting through. So it all depends on how you uh, make the lamp and the glass you use and things like that. Um, 
Uh, the, uh, let me answer one more thing about that. Is the, the way the lamp is enclosed in the device can also affect this because it, it can help um, essentially reduce the, imagine the air movement by the lamp. If it's completely enclosed inside, you imagine like in a little box, some of them were like that. Um, there's not a whole lot of air getting in and out of the little teeny box that actually has the UV lamp in it. So it can't really, you can't get a whole lot of ozone out of it. And this is very much a related question from Tom Wilson. Um, it really, again, has to do, I think, with a band pass on these lamps. So uh, what were the lamp types used on UV devices, spliced, fused, or something else? Were any straight germicidal UVC, so those are the 254 nanometer lamps that were tested? If so, which device tested? Well, I don't know the details. I, I don't think I can answer that question in detail. The manufacturers don't describe their lamps. Um, in detail, uh, most of them, I'd say, don't describe their lamps in their material. We just would take the, the, the devices as is. So, um, sorry. That's <laughs> no, okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Thank you very much for the excellent talk. I have a question specifically on slide 43, which shows the evidence of temperature dependence of device 8. So, it's clear from the plot that the ozone concentration in the room kind of check the temperature very well. So we can see both the going up and down. Which slide was 43? That? 43? Oh, this one, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's pretty clear uh, the concentration check the temperature very yep. well. But, but is that really the temperature dependence or it's just because the, the, the instruments, I mean, the ozone generator or the UV lights going on and off and on and off, which sure. makes this going up and Yeah, that's a good question. A, while we're on that slide, I have a related question. Yeah. The relative humidity also, also shifts, yep. and you're able to rule out humidity as a possible. Oh, yeah, so that's an excellent question, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me answer the first question. The device is on all the time. It's not turning on and off. Um, the device is downstream from the air handler. And so it's being hit with the high temperature of the, air, the heater directly. So it's actually experiencing a much higher temperature than the room is. So this is, so you can see how that would, um, it, it's, it's, these lamps are quite sensitive, quite sensitive to temperature, but it's actually that much more sensitive because it's in the highest heat zone. Um, and, humidity. oh, humidity. Well, as you change the temperature um, without changing the absolute amount of water in the, in the air, you will change the relative humidity. And so um, I would say that the um, slight changes in relative humidity probably don't have a huge effect. But that doesn't mean that they d it doesn't have, it, it could be that the, the, when you raise the temperature, you also drop the relative humidity dramatically in the duct, and the combination could be doing that. So I can't rule it out now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is another question from David McIntosh. Is there an averaging time associated with the ozone generation rates? For example, are they based on steady state calculations? or based on before and after observed during the intermittent operation inherent to the duty cycle? And did you record operational status of the AHU and the air cleaner? If so, to what resolution? So in other words, sure, per sure, we're, yeah. So there were some limits to what we could do in the field. We didn't instrument the air handling system, okay? But what we did was um, to be consistent among all the homes, when we tested these devices, we always tested them with the air handler uh, on, essentially the fan on, but the heater or cooling off. So there was no cycling during the testing, no cycling of the air handler itself, but the device was turned on or off at our, you know, we, had, we turned it on or off. And we didn't turn it on and off on a, on a cycle. We essentially had it off, we got a background reading, we turned it on, let it stabilize as well as we could, and we got a, a, an average reading for the incremental increase in ozone and the ozone emission rate. Um, the time scales over which we did that were typically on the order of hours. So the, we'd have a couple hours or, or so of a background reading, a couple hours or so of a reasonably stable uh, reading. And you can see here um, from this figure, actually, this is a good figure to look at, that in general the ozone concentrations were relatively stable in different locations, but there's different in different rooms because there is slight differences in the reactivity of different rooms. So I guess this was... Um, this is at a return, and this was in the living room and the bedroom. Living room and the bedroom actually had very, I, I think that's right if I'm looking at this properly. So we would essentially, if we were doing this experiment, we would have taken this re whole region here with it on and um, stable. 
you know, reasonably stable. Yes, it's changing, but it's not. You know, that's because we can't control every parameter in a house. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This question is from Scott. I hope I say this right. Gooch. I have a few quick questions after the presentation. It says, why does the ambient ozone level vary during the course of the day as shown in the chart on page 29? Um, okay. Let's see if I can go to 29. Yes, so the ozone concentration outdoors changes during the day. Um, as shown here, this is a very typical um, picture uh, because uh, ozone is generated by photolysis of NO2, which then produces an oxygen radical, and generate, which then reacts with oxygen to create ozone. That photolysis depends on sunlight, and the sunlight intensity is highest in the middle of the day, so the highest ozone concentration in the middle of the day. At night, the ozone concentrations are lowest because there's no, the sun's not out. It doesn't necessarily go to zero, but it, can go, it tends to go low. Okay, another question from Scott. What were the standard conditions on page 37? Okay. Or slide 37. Ah, um, standard conditions, um, I believe, were 25 degrees C and 50% relative humidity. Um, and, well, the flow rate, of course, is varies, so, yeah. Okay, and then on to slide 40. Oops, this one? Okay. Oh, that must be 40, yeah, though I can't see the number. So, he wants to understand the slide at 40. Is this the time for the ozone to decay by 50% or some other factor? Ah, the ozone decay rate is... is um, is a uh, defined by the um, l essentially it's a slope uh, the, the slope of the um, log of the concentration over time um, and so it's it's the it ends up being a per time I'd have to draw it <laughs> actually I don't have the ability to draw that but that's basically what it is if you take the concentration and take the log of the concentration and um, uh, plot that versus time it is that slope the negative of the slope um, it's not. It's not exactly a half time. Okay, it's uh, something a little bit different than that. It's a logarithmic version. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then finally, what would influence a high versus low reactivity home? And I, I think you did speak about that a little bit. In yeah, it's actually you know it, it, all homes are a little bit different. A high reactivity home has. So let me put it this way. So react ozone is removed by either gas phase reactions or service reactions. But most ozone is generally removed by service reactions because the the total rate at which it's removed by gas radiation reactions tends to be relatively small unless you have a big source of, say, um, nitric oxide from cooking. And so um, it's mostly surface reactions, and everybody has different surfaces in their home and different surface area to volume ratios. Carpet, for example, is a big ozone sink, um, whereas uh, painted walls that are aged are not. Um, vinyl flooring is not a great ozone sink, but certain ceiling tiles are. So it's, it's highly variable. The, the furnishings in a home can significantly influence this. Okay, this question is from, it just says Sanjeev. Nice presentation. Did you have any device which had a negative emissions rate? Um, the, so the question is, does the device actually remove ozone? It certainly, so imagine a, an activated carbon filter would have a theoretically a negative emission rate because it would remove ozone. Um, we didn't detect anything. Um, the way we, at least the, the laboratory method would not have been able to see that because we didn't inject upstream ozone. But it's certainly something to, to consider that some devices might actually have some sort of removal in them. Um, but we didn't see that and we certainly didn't see it in the field. Uh, this is another question from Scott Gooch. Uh, do you have any estimate of the number of installed air cleaners? Oh, so we actually we don't. We don't have a good feel for how many air cleaners are installed in the state of California. Yeah. You know, relative to the, the that's something we were not able to to get to. Yeah. And this is partly directed at us. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what proposed ozone limits might be based on these studies? Well, and yeah, that is that's not me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that is. A, that that's is the state of California. That yeah. is something that we would be looking at, but there, there's nothing decided on something like that at this point. Um, for me, okay, we still have quite a few more. Any other questions in the room? Okay, we'll continue on. We have a few more web questions. This one from David McIntosh again. At what time resolution was the air exchange, um, excuse me, air exchange rate ozone decay and ozone concentration matched? Uh, one minute, one hour, one day. Oh, sure. sure. So we were measuring um, 
Measurements were roughly at one minute intervals, and we used that data for, I believe what we did is we set the CO2 and ozone analyzers to one minute intervals for measuring, yeah. So I think that's the resolution he was interested in, yeah. Yes. Uh, did, this is, again, from David McIntosh. Did you determine the airflow rate of the air handling units in the homes and evaluate the airflow supply per volume or area of the house? Okay, so um, there, we did um, do some measurements in the field. Um, the, that was not a, a major goal, and I believe we have some information in the, in the, um, the uh, report when it comes out. That's a question I'd have to talk to my field um, colleague, the guy, colleague who did the field work. Um, the, the measurements were probably, I believe those were based on a, um, uh, I can't remember what that, that device is called. It's this big thing you stick on the supply duct with a hood on it and it measures flow rate. So they did do the, that testing. They have those measurements. I don't know, sorry? Is it a blower door test? It's not a blower door test. It's um, this big hood thing that kind of sticks on the, the supply and measures flow rates yeah. Yeah, through it. So they have that information. I don't know the um, results of that data. Um, the and I, we certainly somewhere have data on the air handlers themselves. I don't have that here. Okay, thanks. Another question from Hal Levin. Uh, does, this is interesting. Does your work raise concerns about the use of UVGI? Uh, for, so these are germicidal lamp, yeah. UV lamps for infection control in healthcare settings. Well, certainly. I mean, a UVGI lamp um, is uh, produces a fair amount of UV light that does generate ozone. So it certainly is a concern. A um, uh, there's a lot of people working on UVGI lamps and finding that they do have, they are, um, have some value in reducing um, infectious, uh, uh, airborne infections, uh, infectious disease particles, I guess. Um, the question then becomes, what's more important, the infectious disease or the um, ozone? My, uh, if I was going to toss a coin, I would say infectious disease in a hospital setting is probably more important than a little bit of ozone. But I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, this question comes to us from Ron Parsons. He says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Very informative. It's two questions. Is there any benefit to using ozone in induct settings? And why doesn't the study reveal the brand names and the model names of the devices that were tested in the study? Um, I'll, the second part, I'll leave that up to the state of California <laughs> for that. Um, <laughs> well, <I laughs> excuse me. I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, the first question, um, uh, this, is a, this is an open question, whether UV lamps in ducts are going to be efficacious. Certainly UVGI lamps do kill microorganisms. They kill uh, uh, um, airborne infectious disease draw, uh, particles. As far as whether or not they're going to be useful, I'd say that there's one really potentially very useful place for these kinds of devices, and that is in reducing the growth of um, mold on um, air handling coils. And which is probably more important, well, it's probably just as important for health, but it's as important for uh, improving the, the mechanical system's um, operation and maintenance. Um, I don't, uh, there's not that much data out there on this, but it seems likely that that's probably a, a good use of it, as long as the adverse effects of using the device and the ozone that's generated, that could be generated, is ameliorated in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's possible. Yeah, I'm not saying it's completely out of hand, but yeah. Um, as for the second question, um, you know, we, we don't want to call out any one particular ozone or device manufacturer. That's not the goal of the study. We don't want anybody to, uh, to feel that they're being picked on. Um, you know, this is it. for gathering information. Uh, we are not making any decisions right now as to whether or not these are going to be included in a regulation. So, um, you know, if anybody's really, really interested in which devices are tested, that's available in the full report. Do you have anything to add? Anything? Is that no? Okay, okay. <laughs> and then we have one more question. And this comes again from Hal Levin. Uh, what about the level and associated impact of SVOCs, uh, e.g. squalene compounds, on surfaces of the homes you tested? Um, and then, oh, you mentioned 0.5 ACH, but there are homes in California with 0.1 ACH, you know, very tight homes, um, and many in the 0.2 to 0.5 range. So would you comment on uh, the effect of that on concentrations, these low okay. air exchange rates? Sure, on? and, uh, you know, I can, <clears throat> you know. First question is the SVOCs. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, 
Hal brings up this, the, the question of, it turns out that we uh, shed a lot of skin, or, uh, skin flakes, and, we sh and there's a lot of squalene that is um, generated by our bodies, and that happens to be a very good ozone sink. It reacts with ozone readily. And um, do we have any idea what the relative amount of squalene was in one home versus another? No, we don't know that. Um, uh, I, I suspect that, that homes that have a lot of people in them and animals are going to have a lot more reactive surfaces because of that than uh, homes that don't. Um, and so some of the surfaces that probably are going to become reactive are the floors because of this, more reactive than otherwise. Um, so we don't know for sure, but that's certainly one of the consider that's one of the reasons why the, there's a variability in home reactivity. Um, other SVOCs, most SVOCs that we think of as industrially uh, produced SVOCs, not the, the, um, the, those produced by our bodies, are relatively in, unreactive with ozone, and so will not influence the um, reactivity. The second question was the air exchange rate. Well, we can look at this figure here um, just to show you that we did consider air exchange rate, and you can see that for a standard house, this would be the variability in the ozone concentration for various air exchange rates um, for a standard house in this case, and then for the smaller at-risk house. And you can see that for a 0.1 air change per hour at, say, 50 milligrams per hour, you've got 100 ppb. So certainly the tighter the home, the higher the resulting indoor ozone concentration. Absolutely. All right. Anyone else? All right. Well, that, uh, with that, I think we can uh, wrap up our seminar for today. I want to thank everybody for attending, and I'd definitely like to thank Dr. Morrison for all of his efforts on this project. It's very, very much a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.